This morning, the title of the sermon is entitled The Eleventh Hour Workers. The Eleventh Hour Workers. And this title and this understanding really is taken from one parable that we find. Only one parable talks about it. So let's go to that Bible text this morning, shall we? It's found in Matthew chapter 20, and we're starting in verses 1 and 2. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So this person, this man who's a householder, the, pardon me, the owner of the vineyard, he goes out and he looks for laborers of the vineyard and he finds some people standing around not doing anything and they agreed to a penny a day. That was the fair rate that time. They were paid a penny a day. And so these people, they agree and they go into the vineyard, his vineyard, to work for him. Let's continue. Verse 3 and 4. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. So he goes out about the third hour, which is about 9 a.m. You see, the Jews reckon time starting from 6 a.m. And so he goes out at 9 a.m. and he finds more people. And he's like, what are you doing here? And he hires them and they go into the vineyard to work for him as well. Continuing on, Matthew 20 and verse 5. And again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. That's, friends, 12 p.m. Pardon me, my slides are in the wrong order. I think I better change them real quick right now before things mess up a bit more. But anyways, he goes out about the at 12 p.m. and also 3 p.m. and he finds the same group, a uh, same group of people standing there doing nothing. And then verses 6 to 7. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? And they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So this man, he goes out at about the eleventh hour. The eleventh hour at 5 p.m. and he finds still more people standing around idle doing nothing and he hires them to go and work only just for one one hour and this is really where we get this understanding of the 11th hour from and look one hour was just before the time that they would finish work you see they had about 12 hours of daylight 12 hours. And that's really the same here in Malaysia as well. Do you know that in Malaysia here, the longest day, it goes for 12 hours and 10 minutes. 12 hours and 10 minutes. And the shortest hours of daylight that we have here in Malaysia is 11 hours and 49 minutes. So really, the time only varies for, for when the sun rises and when the sun sets. The amount of hours that we have for daylight, it's only it only varies about 20 odd minutes, 20 odd minutes. So really that is about 12 hours if you average out throughout the year. And so, you know, Israel, the Jewish land, it was just like that. They only had hours of daylight for 12 hours, all right? And so this man would be hired at the 11th hour is one hour before it would get dark. And back then they didn't have floodlights. They just had what? They just had fire on a stick, right? That's all they had. They had lamps and that was all it, it would afford for them. Not enough for them to continue working really in a vineyard. So their working hours was only that of daylight time, which was 12 hours. And Jesus verifies this as well. In John chapter 11, verses 9 to 10, the Bible says this, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? 
If any man walketh in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. So Jesus verifies this fact that there is 12 hours in a day. And a man can only work during the daylight hours. So the 11th hour was right at the end. It would be dark right after that. So this 11th hour worker, he's only hired just for one hour. And then comes the pay. Going back to Matthew 20, continuing this parable in verses 8 to 10. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should receive more. And they likewise received every man a penny. Look, it would have been logical thinking if you were the first hour laborer, the one that was hired at the very beginning of the day, it would have been logical to think, hey, I see these guys, they get one penny for one hour's of work. Hmm, I should get at least 10 pennies. I mean, if you're reasoning within yourself, you're thinking at least what? I should be getting more than these guys, right? That would have been logical thinking. I think 10 times out of 10, every single time, we would have thought that train of thought. But what a shock to them when they only received one penny. You see, we're missing one thing, remember. The Lord of the vineyard had agreed with these first hour laborers that had worked for 12 hours or 11 hours for one penny a day. And that was the prevailing rate of the time. It was a fair rate and they had agreed to it as well. So it was not unreasonable to expect more, but it wouldn't have been unreasonable for the Lord to give them one penny as well, you see? So he was not being unfair. And so what happened when it got to these one hour laborers, pardon me, the first hour laborers, what happened when they received that penny in hand? Yes, they were shocked, but what else? Verse 11 and 12. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. What began to happen? They began to murmur. They began to complain. They were unhappy as anybody would have been because they received the same wage as all these other people. But friends, you see, that's the thing. They had agreed for a penny a day. It was not unreasonable for the Lord to pay that amount. But where was the logic in them getting the same? There was no logic found in it at all. Let's continue reading. Verses 13 to 15. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou, thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as to unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? He asks them, Is your eye evil, because I am good? You have a problem with me being good, and doing what I want with my own money? Isn't it fair for me to do what I want, and I want to pay everybody, the same. And that is exactly what happened. There was no logic behind it. Love has no logic. God's love has no logic in how He wants to give heaven to everybody. Yes, we all have the same size mansion. Yes, we all live just as long eternal life. Yes, we all look just as beautiful and glorious. There will not be some special privileges in heaven, right? God will pay all the same. And you know, it's very interesting that we get to the end of this parable and this is what he declares. Matthew 20 and verse 16. Finally, Jesus ends with this intriguing statement. So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. It seems like those first hour laborers that bore the heat of the day, they would not be chosen. 
Why? Because they were murmuring. They were complaining. And it seems from a human standpoint, that would be fair. That would be logical. But not in this parable. God says because of that, because of what you've gone through, because of how you reacted in character, you would not be chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. The first will be last, but the last, the 11th hour laborers, shall be first. Friends, who are the 11th hour laborers? What does that mean to us today? What does this all represent? Well, the vineyard is very clear. The master is very clear. That's Jesus. The vineyard is the world. And the laborers are all those that are working for God. And what does it mean about this 11th hour? Well, it represents that last moment before it gets dark. It represents, represents that last moment of Earth's history before we're plunged into scenes of darkness, which the Bible describes as Jacob's time of trouble. We are living in Earth's last day. Remember, Jesus said there were 12 hours, right? And then, uh, and the group that came in at the last hour, they were the ones that will be chosen, not just called. And it doesn't get any later than the 11th hour. But what is the 11th hour for us today? You see, when you study about last day events, friends, you cannot but just understand that we are in Earth's last hours, final moments before Jesus will come for a second time. The 11th hour started over a hundred years ago. And the signs are all fast fulfilling. We are in the 11th hour of Earth's history. This is a little bit different to the 11th hour laborer. But we are in Earth's final moments. We're going to get to 11th hour laborer just a little bit later in this message. But we certainly, no doubt, are at the very end. If you go over to Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8, that famous chapter where Jesus shocked the disciples about how not one stone of the temple will be left upon another, and they thought the world would come to an end when that happened. So they asked Jesus that question, when will the world come to an end? And he says in verse 6, You shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. They've been going on for a long time, but friends, we have taken pestilences to a new level this past year and a half. And I've preached about this before, friends, but we are living in unprecedented times for those that, have, that are currently alive. I believe no one has gone through such a crisis that we face today where the whole world has gone on lockdown. We are experiencing things that never in our lifetime we have experienced before. And many people are suffering as a result. Famine is coming in as a result as well. Many of us, we are going through hardships and toils and trials such as the world has never seen before. Surely, if you do not know it in this past year and a half, you know it now. We are living in the end of time. We are at the very end, a global pandemic. Friends, when's the last time you've experienced it to this magnitude? Nothing that we've seen in the past 30 years has come close to this. But I want you to see here in verse 8 of Matthew 24. Notice it says that all these are the beginning of sorrows. Friends, when you see that word beginning of sorrows, don't let the word beginning throw you off. What does the word sorrows mean there? It means birth pains as in a mother about to give birth. You see, friends, when, when, when you have children, when, when the mother is pregnant and she's about to deliver, the birth pains begin just before the child is about to be delivered. 
It doesn't take place throughout the nine months of pregnancy. No, it takes place a few days before. It starts a few days before. And you see, when the birth pains begins, you're not at the stage where, oh, you got to stop traveling. The stop traveling is somewhere around 25 weeks, right? 30 weeks, definitely so, so late already, yeah? But, you know, planes will not let you on um, for a pregnant mother at a certain time, right? So uh, I remember our, our first child, our daughter, we, we were in, <clears throat> no, it wasn't my first, it was the second. The second, our first son, she, he was pregnant and we were in Taiwan and she, we were coming back and moving back to Malaysia here. She had to come back a month before we ca I came back because after that, the airplane wouldn't let them travel anymore. She wouldn't be able to fly anymore. So they had to travel first. That was not when the birth pain began. The birth pain began just on the eve of 2014, January 1. And there was a, probably a dull pain here and there a few days before that. And we knew it was close. This is not the time to say, oh, you better stop traveling. You, you, you better stop working already. No, you stop working already a month before that. The, when the birth pains come, your suitcase better be packed. You better be ready. Because at any time when the contractions come up uh, once every 10 minutes, it's time to go to the hospital. You see that? These are the beginning of sorrows. When you see that there in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8, that means we are at the end, even at the door. Life is not normal anymore. You cannot go on as normal anymore. And friends, I believe that even now, Jesus is at the door, ready to come. This is how late we are into the 11th hour. I believe we're at 11.55. Oh, I shouldn't say 11.55. We're thinking PM. We are at the 11th hour and 55th minute before the sun is about to set, before the world is about to be plunged into darkness. F friends, we do not have that much time left. And Jesus says in Matthew 20 verse 16, the last shall be first and the first last. Many shall be called, but few will be chosen. Friends, how can we be sure that we don't miss out? How can we be sure that we are called and also chosen? You know what's very interesting? Because, you know, we're not giving much detail here in this parable. But what's very interesting is the preceding chapter, Matthew chapter 19. And look what it says at the very last verse. Matthew 19 and verse 30. Many that are first shall be last. And the last shall be first. Certainly these two chapters must be linked. We are going to find the answer of being called and chosen in Matthew chapter 19. And really, we're, we're going to start back there in verse 16 of Matthew 19. It is a familiar story to most of us, but just in case you don't know it so well, we're going to go through this here and there just to catch up for all those that are reading this for the first time. Matthew 19 and verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life or may have eternal life? You see, this story is about the rich young ruler. And he comes and asks Jesus, What can I do so that I can inherit eternal life. How does Jesus respond? Verse 17, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus tells this man to keep all the commandments. And he replies, I've kept this from my youth. I grew up in a Christian home. He was a Christian. And he is what we would call today a first hour laborer. And he asks, What else do I lack? 
And so Jesus promptly replies in verse 21 to 22, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You know, Jesus tells him, sell everything that you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. And the young man couldn't do it. It was too much for him. He was sorrowful, not knowing that Jesus was even more sorrowful that he was choosing the world over him. This young man chose the God of this world, the riches of this world over Christ and the imperishable treasures that await us there in heaven. The love of money was more important to him than to be a follower of Christ on this earth. You know, friends, was this a salvational issue? Well, look at what Jesus says after the young man leaves. Let's continue reading. In Matthew 19, 23 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. That sounds salvational to me, doesn't it? And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is what? Impossible. But with God all things are possible. Friends, it is hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. But with Christ it is possible. With Christ abiding in the heart, anything is possible. But this man chose the riches of this world over Jesus. He loved the world more than he loved Jesus. Could Christ have helped him? Yes. But he needed to sell everything. He needed to. And so promptly, Peter, hearing what Jesus said, he speaks up and look at what he says in verse 27. Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus, what will we get? We left everything, right? What will we get? And Jesus replies, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the imperishable treasures in heaven, friends. And everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But then he says in verse 30, the conclusion of where we looked at earlier, many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. This is how this phrase is used in this context of the rich young ruler. Who was the first? Who was the first to be called? It was the rich young ruler. He represented the Jewish nation. He followed God from his youth, and, and the blessings of the gospel always comes upon those that follow Jesus, even from a young age. And to this extent, the blessings of the gospel came upon him that he even was able to amass some wealth to be called the rich young ruler. But in the end, he forgot who was the giver of all those blessings. You see, at first, God chose this Jewish nation. God chose Abraham. That's where he started. And all the way down to this young man's time, the Savior of the world came to Jerusalem and no other country. God had really blessed the whole world, but he came especially to be with the Jews and the Israelites first. But what happened? They lost sight of God along the way. They would worship idols. They would worship money. They would choose the world. They would choose alliances and personal and political alliances that were not in harmony with God's will, yoking themselves up with other people that were ungodly, of people of different religions and of different nations that did not know God. They would persecute 
Yes, the Jews, the Israelites, they would persecute the prophets and the priests who were faithful to God, who called out their sins. They would ask for a king so that they could be like the other nations around them. And at every step, they were looking at all these other nations just to mimic them, just to follow them, look at the world to see what they were doing so that they could follow them and not asking God what they should do. And God did all that He could to chase after them. Every time they came back, He was faithful. He would bless them. He would deliver them from their enemies. But they kept rebelling. They kept going against His will. And so God would turn to heathen nations. He would turn to other people. He would give light to the heathen, the Nebuchadnezzars of this world, the Naamans of this world, Ruth and Rahab, streams of light would shine out to others because the first hour laborers were rejecting the blessings of serving in the vineyard, of following Jesus. So God would turn to other people, even the man that helped Jesus carry his cross on the way to Calvary was not a Jew, Simon of Cyrene. And then we come to another character in the Bible, His name is Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, verse 2. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans. And he was rich. He was a chief publican. He wasn't just any ordinary tax collector. He was the chief of them. And you know, every publican was a cheater, a liar in those days. There was nothing honest about them. But you know how the Bible looked at them? In Matthew 9, verse 10 to 11, it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? You see, the publicans bore even a a special mention. They weren't just ordinary sinners. No, they're sinners and there's publicans. This is how wicked these people were. This is how the Jews looked at them. They were classed together with the harlots and all these other, you know, the prostitutes and the heathen people. This is how Zacchaeus was. This is what was his profession. And he was a chief of all of them. But going back to the story, verse 3, he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. Zacchaeus was a short man. And so what did he do? He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Jesus goes to eat at his house. And Zacchaeus is so happy, he scrambles down the tree, doesn't care how how the tree is probably ripping away at his, his nice fine clothing. He jumps down because no one has been to his house for a long time to eat. But he comes down and Jesus makes his way to his house. And while Jesus is eating, Zacchaeus stands up. And look at his declaration in verse 8. Look at what he says. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord! The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Zacchaeus is willing to give away all his riches. He's willing to do what Jesus wanted the rich man to do, the rich young ruler. Just one encounter was all it took. Just one meal was all it took for Zacchaeus to say, Lord, I'm ready to follow you all the way. I'm willing to sell everything. And those that I cheated, I'll give back fourfold. And everything else, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. He was willing to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Don't think he had some sort of little secret gold mine where he could produce more gold and it's like, you know, it doesn't matter. No, Zacchaeus probably came away from this encounter very poor, but a true follower of Jesus. You see, Zacchaeus would represent the 11th hour laborers. He would represent the 11th hour laborers. 
the rich young ruler was the first our laborer. The publican versus the Jew. The tax collector versus the Christian. One, we should assume automatically by, by nature of your profession, should be a true follower of Jesus, right? You're meant to be faithful. Not the tax collector, but the Christian. But yet it was a tax collector that was willing to follow Jesus, the command that he gave, and go with him all the way. Notice, Jesus did not even need to say to Zacchaeus, now Zacchaeus, you know, it's time to stop your cheating ways. You, you, you've done enough wickedness. You got to repent or else you're not going to have a part in the kingdom of heaven with me. No, he didn't have to say anything of that sort. He just stood up and said, I'm ready to follow you, Jesus. The relationship that Jesus had with him was enough of a driving force to change Zacchaeus. To, to say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to give up everything. You know, friends, we have been living in the 11th hour. Now we're coming back to time, not the laborer, but we've been living in the 11th hour of Earth's history since 1844. We are in the seventh church of Revelation, the Laodicean church. We are in the sixth seal the seventh seal is the second coming of Jesus. We are at the very end of time. We are in the seventh trumpet. It is so clear that we are at the truly, the toenails of time in the image of Daniel chapter 2. We are at the very end, friends. That rock is about to strike. The earth is about to go into darkness. Probation is about to close on this whole earth. And friends, the Adventist church is the first hour laborer of this time that we are living in. Did you catch me? We are living at the end of time, the 11th hour, but the Adventist church has been called, we are not the 11th hour laborer. We are the first hour laborers. I want you to understand this, friends. You know, the, the call that was given to ancient Israel has been given to the Adventist church. We are to be a light to the world. God has given this church to be a keeper and a repository of His law. When you read Revelation 12, 17, the dragon is angry with the woman and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. That that remnant church, we so happily proclaim it is the Adventist church because there are two defining characteristics found there. We keep the commandments of God and we have the testimony of Jesus. And yes, friends, the Adventist church believes in all 10 commandments. We believe in following all 10 commandments. We believe in the Sabbath. And we are proud to admit it that this church is called out of the pages of prophecy. Just like how the church, the nation of Israel, kept the Ten Commandments in that Ark of the Covenants. We have been guarding God's sacred law for the past 170, 80 years. We are the first our laborers. We have the testimony of Jesus. We believe in studying the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and God has given us great light. And just as God gave prophets to speak to and through the nation of Israel, God has given us a wonderful prophet in the ministry of Ellen White. Friends, our church has been called first to shine to the world. We were that first hour laborer. Just like the Israelites have been called, starting with Abraham there, the beginning of the nation of Israel the very first. No other nation was called and no other church in our time will be called. Yes, many people will still be called, but no other church, I believe, will be called. We are that first hour laborer. And friends, could it be that history is repeating itself because God is calling us to finish the work. But are we going to be true to that work that He's called us to from the very beginning? 
Or are there going to be other 11th hour laborers that will come in at the end and replace those seats that have been, have been warmed and have been taken by Seventh-day Adventists for so long, friends? Are there going to be many that are going to come out from the, the darkness and from the, the woodworks and, and from the depths of sin and come and stand with God's faithful people, but not necessarily stand with them, but more likely replace them at the very end of time? I'm embarrassed to say that, you know, every time this, well, not every time, but a few times already this past week, we sat around our lunch table and we're talking about all the people that are out there feeding people that are less fortunate than us. And here is the pastor and his wife and the Seventh-day Adventist members sitting around at a table eating by themselves. I'm ashamed to admit that I have not been doing the work of God, friends. I'm not pointing at anyone out there. But we've got to get out there and do the work that God has called us to do. This morning I was just reading in my devotion about feeding the hungry, helping those that are blind, the maimed, that not as fortunate. But the Adventist church to a large degree is failing. The first hour of labor, we're failing. Why? We're focused on self-preservation. We're still focused on our studies and our livelihood and taking care of our families and we're just still so focused on self. That the stones are crying out. Those that don't know God are doing the work of God. And one day they're going to come across the truth that even we are neglecting to preach. And they're going to come into the Adventist church and take our place. With all the blessings of the gospel that God has given us, it's still so easy for us sometimes, isn't it, to murmur and complain. Friends, do we have the character of Christ today? Are we doing His work? Or are so many of us just focused on our own life? We claim the name of Christian and Seventh-day Adventist. We wear it proudly. But it doesn't mean that we are true Christians in heart. Friends, our focus is all wrong. It's time to break away from this world, the riches of this world and the glitter and the gold of this life. And you know, maybe some of you, it just seems absurd that I would suggest such a thing. Then I want you to consider the words of Christ. You must be born again. The words that he spoke to Nicodemus, a first hour laborer. You must be born again. Our focus is wrong because our hearts, they're not right with Christ. Just as Nicodemus asked, how can these things be? He couldn't understand it because spiritual things were spiritually discerned and he couldn't discern it. His affections were all wrong. His mind and his heart was in the wrong place and the affections of our lives. We've been setting it too much on the earthly things and not things above, friends. Waking up early to spend time with Christ is unfathomable to many. Just waking up early for Jesus is difficult. Giving more than 10% to God's storehouse is crazy. How am I going to have money to save? Dressing modestly or changing our diets? It's impossible. And we start pointing out and mocking others and getting angry and murmuring against God. Spending 24 hours thinking about nothing but God is torture. And many of these sorts of experiences are experiences that exist amongst Seventh-day Adventists today. And so the message comes down to us again this morning. And yes, I'm talking specifically to Seventh-day Adventists you must be born again. You must be born again. We're in the right church, friends. We're in the right church, but we're a step away from Jesus. Or as Ellen White says, some of us, we are a day's journey from Christ. And we're infinitely short of the kingdom of heaven because our affections are misplaced. Jesus says, you got to be born again, my son. You gotta be born again, my daughter. You gotta surrender. 
let me replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Just open the door. Let me come in. Let me sup with you. And if I, as I sup with you, as I eat with you, as I did with Zacchaeus, you will be born again. Christian standards, what are they? I'm totally in love with Jesus. It doesn't matter anymore. But friends, Jesus is waiting for you to surrender today. He wants to come in. Won't you give him a chance? Just a chance. Stop looking at all the works and, and, and just getting miserable over the failures of this life and then trying to reason away why we shouldn't have to do this and we don't need to do that. We don't need to eat this way. We don't need to dress this way. Sabbath, ah, is not so important. We start to whittle away God's word altogether. But the issue is not that. The issue is a condition of our hearts. And Jesus says, let me put my law into your heart. Let me write it there. That's the new covenant experience. That's the born again experience. With men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And not only will you be able to do it, but He will give you joy in doing it as well. He'll give you joy in the journey. He'll give you satisfaction and peace in your heart. But He needs to give you experience that is beyond yourself to give yourself this morning. It's the experience of born again. Friends, will you be willing to say with me this morning, Lord, I'm willing to surrender my life to you. I want to experience the peace that passes all understanding. I want to experience that joy that comes even when I'm going through manifold temptations and trials. I want to see the Sabbath as a delight. I want to read your word with great joy. I delight in the law of the Lord. In his law, I meditate day and night. God, I want that experience. Friends, don't you? I'm tired of this miserable Christian experience. I want something better. And it starts with surrender to Jesus today. I don't know what your experience has been like in the past, and I'm not trying to presume anything. But what I see from Scripture is that many of the first hour laborers, many of those that have come to church in the Seventh-day Adventist church are going to be lost at the end of time. And I don't want you to be lost, friends. I want to see all of us there in the kingdom of heaven at the end of time, standing on the sea of glass, singing the song of Moses, the song of victory, because Jesus is the one that has given us that victory. And I want that to start today. How about you? I hope that you bow your heads with me and pray. And pray with me in your heart as well, that God would give us that born-again experience today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, forgive us for playing church for so long. Forgive us that even thinking that the, the, the name Seventh Day Adventist means anything with you. It does, Lord, if our hearts are right with you. I just pray that you would please come into our hearts this morning. Lord, help us to refocus. Help us just to take our minds off of money and wealth and things of this world just for a moment and to say lord we surrender our hearts right now we open the door of our hearts please come in quickly take away that stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh lord help us to understand what it really means to be born again lord please come in and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves please change our characters change our lives Give us the life of Christ. Please give us your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us be born of water and of the Spirit today, that truly we might be created anew in Christ Jesus today. Give us meaning in this life, Lord. Give us joy. Give us uh, peace that passes all understanding. Give us, Lord, that great delight that comes in following you as our Savior. Please, Lord. 
take away that stale experience that we've been having all this time and truly give us true delight in your word and in your Sabbath today as well. Thank you for your pray in Jesus' name. Amen.